We live in a troubled world. Just last night I spoke to a man whose home is coming apart. He's afraid that nothing he can do is going to be able to salvage the relationship which he has with his wife and his two children. Just before that, I talked to a woman in the hospital who's dying of cancer. She's had probably four or five operations in the last two weeks. She has had a colostomy. She's experiencing extreme pain and nausea. Not too long ago, I was privileged to interview a man who had been imprisoned in a Soviet prison camp in Siberia for 16 long years. A few months back, I was privileged to interview a group of refugees in Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, who had escaped from Fidel Castro's Cuba. We live in a troubled world. I am reasonably certain that you have the same kind of problems that other people have, perhaps financial problems or physical problems or emotional problems. We live in a troubled world. And in this troubled world, people sometimes go to the Bible for help. And they start reading in the Bible in the book of Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible. And after they have read for uh, an hour or two, they're excited because the book of Genesis is filled with interesting stories about the creation and the fall, about the flood which came in the days of Noah, about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. They're excited to get to the second book of the Bible. That's the book of Exodus. And they begin reading about Moses and the Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And it's an exciting, thrilling story. Several movies and many books have been made from the story of Moses and the Exodus from the land of Egypt. But along about the 21st chapter of the book of Exodus, they begin reading a different kind of book. Now it's a book of technicalities, a book of tedious details about Jewish law. They get into the book of Leviticus, it's no better, and they find themselves bogged down in all sorts of intricate details, and sometimes they throw up their hands in disgust and give up the Bible. We do not want that to happen to you. And so in this series of 13 lessons on the Bible, we want to do something to cause the Bible to come together, to cause the puzzle of scriptures to all of a sudden begin to make sense so that you're not confused by the Bible or intimidated by all the stories in the Bible. But we want you to see the Bible as a cohesive unit. And we want to teach you in this lesson in particular that the main character of the Bible, the central feature of all the scriptures, is Jesus Christ. E.U. Cook wrote a poem about Jesus back in the year 1891. Let me read it for you. No one ever pointed out the road that leads up to that blessed abode. No one such blessings e'er bestowed but Jesus. No one that we have ever known has ever sacrificed a throne to come and call us as his own but Jesus. No one e'er came to make the call that he his kingdom might install and give his life blood once for all but Jesus. No one e'er made the boast that he had yielded up the ghost to save from death so great a host, but Jesus. No one such miracles e'er wrought, no one such lessons ever taught, and comfort gave and pleasures brought, but Jesus. No one did ever yet arise from lowly tent to vaulted skies with all that it to us implies, but Jesus. No one e'er wore a robe so white, no one e'er cast such shining light. No one e'er made our path so bright but Jesus. No one is there who intercedes and with our Father daily pleads and knows full well our wants and needs but Jesus. No one e'er drove away the gloom that clusters round the dismal tomb and in its stead made flowers bloom but Jesus. We want to, in this lesson, show you that the whole Bible is a book about Jesus. Someone has said it like this, the Bible is the frame of which Christ is the picture. The Bible is the story of which Christ is the theme. The Bible is the sky of which Christ is the sun and the moon and the stars. If Christopher Columbus could only have looked at this globe 
before he set out on his journey to discover the new world, his journey would have been much different. If he could have only had five minutes to survey the continents of the earth and to see the oceans as they relate to the continents, a lot of fear would have been taken away from those men who served under his command. And that's what we're going to try and do with the Holy Bible. The Bible is actually a divine library of 66 different books. 39 of them are in the Old Testament scriptures. 27 of them are in the New Testament scriptures. The first five books of the Bible are books of law. They are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The next 12 books are books of history. They are Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. The next five books are books of poetry. They are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. The next books are books of prophecy. They are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, and Malachi. When we come to the New Testament scriptures, we find the first four books are biographical books about Jesus. They are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They are called the Gospels because the word gospel means good news. The next book is a book of history. It is called the Acts of the Apostles. And then we get into the letters or epistles written by inspired men to the churches of the first century. The epistles are Romans and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Jude. The last book of the Bible is a book of prophecy. We call it the book of Revelation, referring to the revelation or the unveiling and consummation of all things. You know, it's possible to read the Bible and not see Jesus. In the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus appeared to two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. And the scriptures record that he upbraided them, saying, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Did you note that he began at Moses and then went through all the prophets expounding unto them in the scriptures the things concerning himself? Later on in the same chapter, he appeared unto his disciples in the upper room and said, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms spoke about Jesus. Now you'll notice here the book of Genesis. The word Genesis literally means beginning. And in this book we find the beginning of the heavens and the earth, the beginning of man, the first sin, the beginning of God's efforts to redeem man. And in the book of beginnings we find in chapter 3 a promise of God that the seed of woman was going to bruise or crush the serpent's head. Did you know that was a prediction about Jesus? Now it was not accurately understood at that time, but nonetheless from this side of the event we see very clearly that Jesus was born of a woman and through death Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death that is the devil. When we get into the 12th chapter we find a promise of God to Abraham to get away from his country and away from his kindred and away from his father's house and God would make of him a great nation and be a blessing to him. He would bless everyone that blessed Abraham. He would curse everyone that cursed Abraham and in Abraham and in Abraham's seed all the families of the earth would be blessed. Again, that was a prediction about Jesus, for in Jesus all the families of the earth indeed have been blessed. In the 49th chapter of the book of Genesis, there is another prophecy. The, script, uh, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. and That is another amazing prediction about the coming of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. When we move into the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, the word Exodus is linguistically associated with the word exit, and it talks about the people of God leaving the land of Egypt. In this book, we are told that there was a messenger of death 
who came down and destroyed the firstborn of all those houses that did, that did not have blood smeared upon the lintel of the door. The Hebrew people who believed God killed the Passover lamb exactly as the Lord had instructed them and were therefore delivered from the messenger of death. Did you know that Jesus is our Passover and that the book of Exodus actually tells us about the coming of Christ? The book of Leviticus is about the responsibilities given to the tribe of Levi. L-E-V-I form the first four letters of the word Leviticus. And here in this book we find all sorts of rules and regulations given to these people. In the eighth chapter of the book of Leviticus we find instructions in particular about Aaron, the high priest. And we, this side of the cross, looking back on that event from a perspective that we are privileged to have, know that Jesus Christ is our great high priest and that he ministers now on our behalf in the very presence of God. In the book of Numbers, we find a very interesting story about the people of God experiencing death and finding life by looking upon a brazen serpent. And Jesus said, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever looks on him might live. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The word Deuteronomy literally signifies second law. The word namos is the Greek word for law. Deuter means second. So the law was given a second time because those who received it the first time perished in the wilderness because of their sin. The Ten Commandments are found two times in the Bible. The first time in the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus. The second time in the fifth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. The book of Deuteronomy tells us about Jesus and predicts that someday a prophet would come who would be just like Moses. And then anyone who did not hearken unto the voice of that prophet would be utterly destroyed from among the people. And so Peter speaking under inspiration in the third chapter of the book of Acts applied those very words to Jesus. Jesus is literally in every book of the Bible. We could go through all the books of history and point out that the very name Joshua is the Hebrew name for which Jesus is the Greek name. They both mean Savior. When we get into the book of Judges, we find a people oppressed and delivered, and Jesus is our great deliverer. When we get into the book of Ruth, we read about a kinsman and a redeemer. And we are excited to discover that Jesus is our kinsman and redeemer who does for us exactly what Boaz did for Ruth in this beautiful story in the Bible. When we get into the books of Samuel, we discover that the prophet was anointing those who were to be prophets or priests or kings. And we are also excited to know that Jesus is our prophet and our priest and our king and he is the anointed one of God. The word Messiah is the word which means anointed in the Hebrew language, and the word Christ is the word which means anointed in the Greek language. In the books of Kings, we are excited to discover that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, and by studying the kings of the northern and southern kingdoms, we get some insight into the ministry of Jesus. When we get into the books of Chronicles, we discover the first nine chapters of 1 Chronicles are given over to long genealogical records. To the average student, that's a very boring section of the Bible to read. But to those who believe the prophetic utterances about Jesus, it's exciting to know that the ancestors of Jesus are carefully chronicled for us to prove that Jesus is indeed the Messiah of God. And Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther and all the other books of the Bible are identically like these from the standpoint that Jesus Christ is the center of the scriptures. He is the story of God manifested to mankind. He's the word of God. As a matter of fact, John's gospel says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Later on in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, the scriptures teach that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. There is no contradiction between the word of God as manifest in Jesus Christ and the word of God as manifested on the pages of the Holy Bible. All 66 books of the Bible are stories about Jesus. 
And when you read them from the proper perspective, you will see Jesus on literally every page of the Holy Bible. The concept of the incarnation literally staggers the imagination. And yet it is evident for all who have eyes to see. He was born in a manger. His relatives were poor and inconspicuous. He had virtually no formal education, probably learning at his mother's knee. Maybe he attended a little village synagogue school. But Jesus challenges the great intellects of every age. He didn't write any books, and yet more books have been written about him than any other. He didn't write any music, and yet he has put melody in a million hearts and inspired more songs than any other man who ever lived. The date lines of the world bend around the manger of his birth. He didn't use medicine to heal, and yet he has inspired men to enter the field of medicine and to construct hospitals and clinics for the benefit of mankind. He didn't preach over 100 miles from the little carpenter shop where he labored in Nazareth, and yet his words echo on every continent and, had, and his words have been translated into more languages and dialects than those of any other. The word martyr is actually a Greek word coming from the word martyros, which means witness. And I could talk to you about Christian witnesses, about individuals both in the Bible and outside of the Bible who are willing to die for their faith. Let me introduce to you this little book by Josh McDowell. We referred to it in our first lesson. It is called Evidence Which Demands a Verdict. And in this book on page 81, we find not only the 27 documents of New Testament Scripture as evidence for the historical Christ, but we find also the testimony of church fathers like Polycarp and Eusebius, Irenaeus, Ignatius, and Justin, and Origen, and many, many others. But in addition to these biblical references and these Christian fathers, we find also non-Christian and non-biblical historians referring to Jesus Christ. Individuals like Cornelius Tacitus and Lucian of Samosata and Flavius Josephus and Suetonius and Plinius Secundus and Tertullian and Phlegon and Thallus and Mara Barsarapion and Justin Martyr and the Jewish Talmud. Some time ago I picked up a little book by Earl Albert Rowell, I think it's out of print now, called Prophecy Speaks. And in that book, there were a number of interesting quotations, not from Christians, not from those who even believe the Bible, but from unbelievers who were nonetheless dramatically impressed by the life of Jesus Christ. H.G. Wells is a familiar name to many people. He was an unbeliever and a very pessimistic individual. The last literary effort which he gave to the world was called Mind at the End of Its Tether. Yet, listen to what H.G. Wells had to write about Jesus. This is found in the American Magazine, July 1922. Jesus of Nazareth is easily the dominant figure of history. I'm speaking of him, of course, only as a man, for I conceive that the historian must treat him as a man, just as the artist must paint him as a man. To assume that he never lived and that the accounts of his life are inventions is more difficult and raises more problems in the path of the historian than to accept the essential elements of the gospel stories as fact. So the historian, disregarding the theological influence of his life, writes the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth at the top of the world's greatest characters. Or listen to the words of John Stuart Mill, the man who is described as bridging the rationalism of the 18th century with the liberalism of the 19th century. He wrote in his book on the three essays of religion, nature, the utility of religion, theism. When this preeminent genius is combined with the qualities of probably the greatest moral reformer and martyr to that mission who ever existed upon earth, religion cannot be said to have made a bad choice in pitching upon this man as the ideal representative and guide of humanity. Nor even now would it be easy, even for an unbeliever, to find a better translation of the rule of virtue from the abstract into the concrete than to endeavor so to live that Christ would approve our life. Or consider the words of William E. H. Leakey, Irish historian and philosopher, in his work, The History of European Morals, pages 8 and 9. It was reserved for Christianity to present to the world an ideal character who throughout all the changes of 18 centuries has inspired the hearts of man with an impassioned love 
has shown itself capable of acting on all ages, all nations, all temperaments, and all conditions, has been not only the highest pattern of virtue, but also the strongest incentive to its practice, and has exercised so deep an influence that it may be truly said that the simple record of three short years of active life has done more to regenerate and soften mankind than all the disquisitions of philosophers and all the exhortations of moralists. Or, what about the words of H. L. Menschken, who is described as the, uh, the apostle of ideological rebellion following World War I? In his treatise on the gods, he said, the story of Jesus is touching beyond compare. It is indeed the most lovely story ever devised. Beside it, the best that you will find in the sacred literature of Moslem and Brahman, Parsi and Buddha, seems flat, stale and unprofitable. The real worth of a teacher is not best gauged, by, however, by what they say or by what their admirers or critics say about them, but what they actually produce. Jesus said it like this, by their fruits you shall know them. Men do not gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles. In this regard, Charles Darwin paid, paid Jesus Christ and Christianity one of its greatest compliments. After returning from his world tour, which was responsible for weaving his evolutionary preconceptions into a theory of evolution. He said this in England, those who criticize Jesus will forget or do not remember that human sacrifices and the power of an idolatrous priesthood, a system of profligacy unparalleled in, an, unparalleled in another part of the world, infanticide, a consequence of that system, bloody wars where conquerors spared neither women nor children, that all these have been abolished, and that dishonesty and temperance and licentiousness have been greatly reduced by Christianity. In a voyager to forget this is base ingratitude. For should he chance to be at the point of shipwreck on some unknown coast, he should most devoutly pray that the lesson of the missionary had reached thus far. The lesson of the missionary is an enchanter's wand. The house has been built, the windows framed, the fields plowed, and even the trees grafted by the New Zealander. The march of improvement consequent to the induction of Christianity throughout the South Seas probably stands by itself in the records of human history. Howard Russell, in his book, A Lawyer's Examination of the Bible, tells the story of James Russell Lowell, who was the Minister of State to England, uh, talking to a group of critics who were criticizing the Bible. James Russell Lowell said, I want to challenge you skeptics to find me a place 10 miles square on the face of this earth where a woman can live in honor and decency, where there is any regard for little children or for elderly people, where the gospel of Jesus Christ has not gone and paved the way. Now, if you can find a place like that, he said, I want to challenge you to immigrate there and advocate your unbelief. It is the height of inconsistency to live in a Christian community and to enjoy all the blessings which that community brings your way, and then to turn around and try and kick down the very ladder by which you have climbed as far as you are in society. I want to encourage you now, in the next minute or two, to read the Bible again. And as you read it, to look for Jesus, to fill your life with knowledge about him. Several years ago, the Bible expositor and illuminator put it like this. The knowledge of Christ is a purse full of gold. It will pay your way in all the strange places of life. It will fetch you comforts more choice than those found in any king's houses. It will open gates which are closed to the wise of the world and unlike earthly treasures. The more you spend of it, the more you have. The knowledge of Christ is a flower that never fades. Carry it in your bosom, and it will fill your life with fragrance. It's a light that cheers the darkest night, and the longer it burns, the brighter it grows, and the fierce winds only make it burn more clearly. It turns a hovel into a palace. It makes a rough road smooth. It is carried easily, and it costs nothing. It is a well whose crystal stream makes all about it beautiful and pure. It refreshes the weary passerby. It never knows the drought of summer. And from life's morning to its latest eve, it flows steadily, carrying joy and song throughout its course. It is a sunbeam from paradise, a smile from the face of God. 
the harp of angels, the Bible of the New Jerusalem, the key to heaven's treasury. It's a passport into the presence of the king. It makes rainbows on storm clouds. It transforms tears into pearls and thorns into apple trees and it causes the desert to blossom like a rose. It makes the heart larger than a kingdom, richer than a bank and brighter than a palace and happier than a grove in which a thousand birds are singing. Get this knowledge above all things. Increase it. Teach it. Live it. And prize it far above rubies. For it is your happiness, your glory, and your life.